this is my first trip to Payton since I was about hmm, seven, eight years old, and that is over 40 years, and so I'm very glad I picked a sunny, lovely day to come back. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, in 10 minutes, I'm just going to talk about the rise of the five Roman species to give you all a, a picture of what's happening, about the problems facing them at the moment, and then about the solutions and the ways that we can all help uh, rhino conservation. So I'll run through them in turn. Uh, this will be speedy. So five species. Everybody knows that Africa has the two species, the white rhino and the black rhino. And the white rhino is currently the most numerous um, rhino numbers are counted every two years by the African Rhino Specialist Group, of which I'm a member. And at the last count, at the end of 2012, there were 20,405. And you can be pretty precise with rhinos. You, the good rhino field programs know exactly what they're dealing with. They know the animals individually. So this is, in a sense, the least threatened because it's the most uh, numerous in terms of, of, of individuals, however they're facing particular problems that I'll come on to. Then we've got the black rhino with the distinctive hooked lip, the uh, browsers rather than grazers, and again, critically endangered, just over 5,000 of them. And in terms of where they are in Africa, so we talk about the big four rhino countries. So those, that's Kenya, the ones in darker grey, Kenya, Zimbabwe, Namibia, South Africa. The countries in lighter grey also have rhino populations, but far fewer. There will be le less than 100, fewer than 100 in each of those countries. Mozambique doesn't actually have any of its rhino own rhinos. They were all poached out years ago. And the only ones that are still counted there every two years are the <coughs> unfortunates who have crossed the border from Kruger National Park. So in terms of the most important populations, Kenya, in Namibia, South Africa, those are the ones that we absolutely have to hang on to at all costs. Then in Asia, this is the ones that, that people are not so familiar with, because although the Great one horned or also known as the Indian rhino, is held in European zoos, the other two species are not held in European zoos. I'll come on to those. But so the Great One Horned Rhino, it's found in India and Nepal, so I have to say the Nepalese get upset if you call it the Indian Rhino. There are 3,333, again, at the end of 2012. 2,000 of those are in Kazaranga National Park, which is in a wonderful place in Assam, in the northeastern states of India. It, you can begin perhaps to tell already that there's a bit of a, a problem. You've got a very small park, you've got a lot of eggs in one basket, and if Kasaranga suffers from problems, then Indian rhinos could be threatened very soon. But they're on a lesser category of threat than the black rhino. They're classified by the IUCN red list as vulnerable. Then you have the smart rhino, and this is for me is where the numbers become shocking. Fewer than 100 animals. There are just three in Malaysia, in Sabah, which is that very northern tip of the island of Borneo. WWF camera traps have picked up images of one Sumatran rhino in the southern Indonesian section in Kalimantan. And the other 96, we believe, are found on the island of Sumatra in just three populations. So these animals are also classified as critically endangered. And then finally, we have the Javan rhino. Until recently, this was one of the very few photographs. Until recently, we thought that there were only about 35 Java rhinos, but last year, a series of surveys, camera traps, patch occupancy, dung DNA, fecal studies have established that actually there is a glimmer of hope on the horizon. There are 58 to 61 individual animals. There's great individual ID photographs of these animals with different raggedy ears and, and, and different horn profiles. So these are absolutely at the brink, if you like, of extinction. It's very, very close. Because there are just so few of them. To have a viable population of rhinos, you've got to have a minimum of 20 unrelated founder animals. And when you're talking about such low numbers, that's incredibly hard to achieve. So why are rhinos becoming so endangered? And obviously the story that's in the newspapers at least once a week these days um, is the poaching threat, particularly in South Africa. And I have to say I joined Save the Rhino in 2001. For the, I didn't realise how lucky I was for the first seven or eight years 
Rhino conservation's biggest problem is where can we put the expanding populations? What habitat is there? Where have we got room for them? But now, I'm afraid everything has changed. I wish I'd enjoyed those years more while I had them. I had no idea what was coming. Sorry, that's the only nasty picture I'm going to show, but you have to see it. I'm sorry, you can't do a talk about rhinos without showing the reality of what's happening. So this is a table produced by the <coughs> African Rhino Specialist Group. Just to show you poaching, I hope you can read the numbers at the back. I'm just going to highlight a few things. It's showing poaching from 2006 through to uh, the end of 2014. It's not quite up to the end for all of the countries. They didn't have all the data in when this table was produced. But I just want to highlight two or three trends so that you understand how the poaching threat is evolving. And the first trend to pick up is in, uh, I'm not sure if I've got a pointer, uh, anyway, I'll wave and point. But in Zimbabwe, you can see that in 2008, well it went up from 21 in 2006 up to 164 in 2008. And you don't have to really study African politics very closely to, um, to, to know that with the breakdown of political, economic, if you remember 2008-9 was when Zimbabwe moved from the Zim dollar to the US dollar after years of hyperinflation. The breakdown of law and order, social unrest and so on meant that people turned to poaching. It was to supplement their incomes but also it was a soft target for external criminal gangs coming from other countries to come in and poach Zimbabwe's riders. So Zimbabwe was the first country to be hit. And something like 90, 95% of the rhinos in Zimbabwe's national parks have been killed. There is one park, Matopas National Park, which, which, which paint and zoo supports, which has still just about got viable numbers of black and white rhinos. The only other places are two private, three private reserves in southern Zimbabwe, which are hanging on to decent populations of rhino. Now, is, is poaching gangs are clever. They're not, you know, just guys chancing it out on, on an opportunity, opportunistic, let's go for some bush meat. Oh, no, there's a rhino. Let's kill that. They are sophisticated in their targeting populations. So once Zimbabwe's populations, rhino populations, were depleted, they turned their attention to South Africa, which has got something like 90% of the world's white rhinos. And so South Africa, i bring a map up, went from 36, 13 in 2007, 448, 668, 1,004, 1,020, and last year the final figure was 1,215 animals. And I'll explain why South Africans rocketed so much. And the last trend I want to highlight and pick up is in Namibia, which went from 0, 1, 2 animals, actually by the end of last year, um, 24 rhinos had been killed in Namibia. When you look at the graph, when you project that poaching trend, <coughs> Namibia is in real danger of being the next country to be hammered. And again, 20, 20 years, two decades of successful rhino conservation risks being undone <coughs> within the space of a couple of years. So that's what the South African growth rate looks like in poaching. It's pretty hideous. And when you work out 1,215 rhinos killed in one year, that's three a day. So between now, whoa, what is it, 6.30, 2.30, you wake up for that midnight drink, trip to the bathroom, another rhino will have been killed. By the time you have breakfast the next morning, another rhino have been will have been killed. It's relentless. And the problem for South Africa is, it's, is that, again, two-thirds of the rhino poaching is happening in Kruger National Park, the green, air, air, green area top right of the screen. And its problem is it's very long border with Mozambique. You know, Mozambique had two, two decades of civil war, which ended in the early 1990s. There are a lot of illegal weapons swirling around in Mozambique. It's very easy to get access to guns and ammunition. And that long border, so Kruger National Park, just to give you an idea, it's the size of Israel, it's the size of Belgium. It has that very long, very porous border with Mozambique. So I just saw a report yesterday that one of the guys at Sand Park, South African National Park, said that last year, in a single year, there were 5,000 people crossing the border in Kruger, into Kruger, determined to kill a rhino. 
Frankly, it's amazing that they only killed 800. What those rangers are going through, none of us can imagine. I can't imagine going out. I mean, it's bad enough going out on night patrols, knowing that there are lions, there are elephants, there are angry buffalo. If you walk into them, that's a problem. To know that there are poachers out there who are willing to shoot you, who are ready to shoot you, I can't imagine how they can say goodbye to their wives and children every night, knowing that they might not be back for breakfast. I just find it. Every time I meet these guys, every time I think about their jobs, I can't begin to imagine what it's like. So when you look at, if you look at the poaching rate <coughs> continuing to go up, and you look at rhino numbers and the way that they breed, so if you, it, the average benchmark, sorry it's a horrible graph, but the average ben benchmark for rhino population growth is 5% a year. As you know, rhinos never have twins, if only they did. They just have one calf at a time. If they're really getting on with it, it's every two and a half, three years. But it, it, so in some populations, they manage to achieve 7%, 9% population growth. Most countries, most populations only achieve 5%. And 5% is the blue line coming down the bottom. So if poaching continues to go up, rhinos only achieve 5% growth rate, then you can see rhinos hit extinction in 2026, 2027. So if any of you are having a baby this year, by the time you're working out what secondary school your child goes to, there are no more rhinos in the wild. So this is why it's urgent. This is, comes from the African Rhino Specialist Group. This isn't me sitting at home making up graphs. This is real. So why are rhinos being poached so much? Well, there was a great study in 2012 produced by Traffic which uh, really looked at the, at the relation, at the trade, illegal trade relationship between South Africa and Vietnam. And Vietnam has emerged as the new rhino horn consumer country. China's probably also using, but the research hasn't been done yet. And essentially there are three types of user, and the most dangerous, most significant user is what's classified as men over 40. And these are successful businessmen who have made their wealth who want to show off how successful they are, how wealthy they are. And for them, rhino horn is the new bling. Just as we might buy a Van Gogh, a wine cellar, an estate in southern France, whatever we want to do with our spare cash, Vietnamese successful businessmen like to buy a whole rhino horn. And sometimes they display it on the mantelpiece, whole, so that when people come around to the house, oh, he's got a rhino horn this big. If they really feel like showing off, they might grind it up from the base, mix it with rice wine to offer as a digestif after a successful business dinner. Or it's a totally new use. It's, ne it's nothing traditional at all. They might grind it up dry and snort it like cocaine. And it's just to show I'm so wealthy, I can afford to drink or snort my rhino horn. So these are the dangerous guys. These are the ones who are driving the price up. The next most significant group are what we call the intenders, the businessmen who haven't yet made their fortunes, but as soon as they have, they want to be able to buy a rhino horn. And then the third group is more like the traditional group, the, the, the people who use it for traditional Chinese medicine. This tends to be housewives with young children who like to have a bit of rhino horn in the bathroom cupboard, cupboard so that if their child has a fever, if, if they have a headache, they would grind some up, mix it with water, the child would drink it, just as we would have paracetamol or aspirin in the cupboard. And as we all know, it's predominantly the same materials in our hair and fingernails. So there is no medicinal value, but it has a placebo effect. And that's why it's so difficult to counteract these generations of belief. Think how long it took us to uh, change attitudes to smoking indoors in the UK. It's not something you can just change overnight. And then the criminal gangs are also inventing new uses for rhino horn because they want to create a market, they want to drive up the price for their product. So they have uh, basically promoted rhino horn as a cure, not for cancer as such, but to detox the effects of chemotherapy. So these gangs are literally, and I use that word advisedly, touring hospital wards, finding families clustered around a dying father, husband, son, mother, and saying, if you really care about your mother, if you really care about your son, wouldn't you do everything, wouldn't you sell everything so that you could buy some rhino horn to see if that cures your loved one? How can a family in that vulnerable state, how can they turn that down? So these cynical, 
hideous criminal gangs are just exploiting every angle they can to make a buck. They don't care that it's rhino horn, they don't care that animals are being killed. It could be drugs, it could be weapons, it could be money laundering, it could be human trafficking. It's just the commodity that at the moment will get them the most money. So that's what we're up against. So poaching is the obvious threat. There are other problems as well, and actually particularly affecting the Asian species. So let's say one big loss is because there are so many poachers coming into places like Kruger National Park, like private game reserves that perhaps hadn't invested in all the security, it's become incredibly expensive to have a rhino population on your land. So some landowners are saying, we can't afford to have rhinos anymore. We're going to replace them with buffalo. There was a, story, a, a case last year, a guy who used to have 50 plus rhinos, sold them all off and he bought buffalo as well, because he could make more money off them without the associated costs. So if we reduce the habitat, the land that's available for riders, we're not going to have places to put them in the future. In Asia, particularly in India, you've got problems with seasonal flooding. So the perfect rhino habitat in, in Assam is along the banks of the Brahmaputra River. It's very rich alluvial soil, grows this enormous elephant grass that's up above your head. Every year, monsoon, the river floods, in fact, more animals drowned in floods last year, more rhinos drowned in floods last year in Kazaranga than were poached. So actually, seasonal flooding, natural disasters, can be just as much of a threat in some areas. This is, yeah, favourite Sumatra rhino picture. <coughs> this is the calf born in June 2012 in the Sumatra rhino sanctuary. Problem in Indonesia and Malaysia has been a couple of couple of factors, again, shrinking of habitat available, and here's where the oil palm plantations really take the bloom. Cutting down whole swathes of forest, reducing land available for rhinos, cutting out the corridors that connected previously protected land is impacting on their ability to breed. And then your Java rhinos, just 60 or so left, they have the misfortune. Java is the most densely populated island on the planet. And the population growth has pushed the Java rhino to that far western tip in Ujong Kulong National Park here. And the problem, if you can read at the back, is that it's pretty near a rather famous volcano called Krakatoa. So if Krakatoa, son of Krakatoa, goes off again, we've lost all of the Java rhinos. There is no insurance population. This is the only place where they survive. So, okay, I've done the gloom and doom, I'm going to get more positive. What can we do to, to save the island? What can we do to hang on to them? And it takes a whole bundle of approaches. <coughs> I'm just going to briefly talk about what we can do around the range states, in the transit countries through which the horn is exiting, in the consumer countries, and then in the rest of the world. And that includes here in the UK. So in the rhino range states, obviously there's all your basic good rangers, protection, security, training, weapons training, these days battlefield medicine, stuff that rangers didn't have to know about seven years ago. You have to know exactly how many rhinos you've got so you can make a decision about whether it's safe to create a second Javan rhino population. For example, we've got 16, <coughs> we need a minimum 20 animals, so actually yes, we could divide that population in half and move another population to a totally separate second place well away from some of Krakatoa. You've got to do training, you've got to do education, you've got to work with the local communities living around the edges of the national parks and the reserves. So yeah, I mean 70-75% of our funding goes on your basic anti-poaching monitoring. If we don't hang on to the remaining rhinos, we really have lost the war. <coughs> Ranger training, really important. Translocations. Every now and again, there's a good news story. This is a picture from August 2013 of a new rhino population introduced into an area in Kenya that hadn't seen rhino for 20 years. And environmental education. You've got to get if those kids become your hearts and minds and your eyes and ears in a community, and they go back to their parents and say, "Mum, mum, dad, dad, we've got to protect the rhinos. This is what they do for us." You've got a great voice. You've you've made the rhino family bigger. The transit countries, so the particular problem areas I mentioned is Mozambique, but there's also a lot of rhino horn being trafficked through Tanzania. Through the Czech Republic, there's an expat Vietnamese community that has been smuggling rhino horns through, 
and there have also been seizures of rhino horn in other East Asian countries. The trouble with intercepting them en route is you don't know where their end users <coughs> are going to be. There's something called CITES, a Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species of Flora and Fauna. They can uh, invoke sanctions, there are moves to do so. There's also wider political pressure. And in fact, a couple of NGOs have launched a petition to lobby the US government to bring trade sanctions against Mozambique and against Vietnam unless they really step up their efforts to tackle rhino poaching. In the consumer countries, so particularly Vietnam at the moment and I think also in China, there is also work that needs to be done. And here we've been very fortunate to get a large grant from the UK government to work with Traffic, a local NGO, to deliver a, behavior, a campaign that we hope will change the behaviour, will hope will drive down demand in Vietnam. So it's designed very much to appeal to Vietnamese sensibilities. It's called the Chi Campaign. It's based on the premise that strength of character, strength of conviction, moral strength comes from within. It isn't from buying a piece of rhino horn, it's from what's inside you. So using imagery that we've market tested, research piloted, and people are telling us, yes, that speaks to me. It might not speak to us in the UK, that's not important. It's what speaks to the Vietnamese that's important. And then here's where we come to the rest of the world, and that includes all of you. Conservation costs money, and I have to say, UK, Europe, USA has been fantastic about stepping up to the plate and supporting rhino conservation efforts. And it, you, can't, you can't raise funds until you can educate people about why they're in danger, what the need is, how urgent the situation is. And so that's why I'm really, really delighted to be partnering with Paint and Zoo, Wild in Art, to, put, to help put on the Great Big Rhino project next year. So I am already following, and I hope all of you are, at Great Big Rhinos. Use those hashtags, follow what's happening. This is a really great way for Paynton, Exeter, the English Riviera generally to get involved in rhino conservation. Ultimately, what we need is more rhino cars, more of these little guys, and that's what I hope this rhino trail will do for us all. Thank you so much. And yeah, thank you.